Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Legacy Well Show. Super pumped up for today's episode. I got my good buddy John Melton here. John, how you doing, bud? Living the dream, man. Excited to be here. Awesome, man. Uh, so John and I, dude, we've known each other for what, like almost ten years, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. We we met a long time ago, actually, in a in a business that we were both involved in. It was a network marketing company, actually. Um, I got a lot of personal development development out of that business and uh, made some great connections, contacts, people like you. And we both have since, you know, dove into some different um, other business ventures. And uh, man, I, I, I respect the hell out of what you've done. Um, making seven figures, multiple seven figures a year in your new business and having a ton of success there. And uh, so you know, obviously how to make money. You know, you're doing a really, really good job at, at keeping money. It's actually easier to do when, when uh, um, you know, you got your house, you got the cars that you want, you got all that kind of stuff taken care of. And now you're able to really stockpile a lot of cash. I want to hear a little bit about that. And, um, and then some of the investments that you're making in order to get your money, making more money for you. So um, why don't you give everybody just kind of a high level, um, where you come from, how you got started, what you got going on, what your current business looks like right now. Yeah, sounds good. Well, first of all, appreciate the uh, the invite, and I can't wait to get you on one of my uh, dual broadcasts, uh, probably a dual Facebook Live. That's how I typically do it, and uh, just would love for you to drop some knowledge on my audience at some point. But uh, you know, man, I, I've been an entrepreneur. Actually, you know what's crazy? Yesterday, now obviously people are going to listen to this at different times, but it was September 25th, 2001, that I went to my very first network marketing meeting and uh, learned about entrepreneurship. Honestly. None of my friends, none of their parents, nobody I knew was talking about business ownership, entrepreneurship, anything outside of go to school, get a degree, and get a J-O-B. And I graduated from high school in 1999 uh, feeling like a loser because honestly, I, I didn't want to go to school. I didn't want to go get a degree. I didn't want a job. I wanted to make money and nobody was talking about other options. So I felt like there must be something wrong with me. And I bet a lot of your listeners can relate to this because mm -hmm. over the last 18 years, I've met so many entrepreneurial minded people that were also terrible students. Uh, I mean, I basically was living for the weekend, right? Like party on the weekends and, uh, you know, just, just, you know, living day to day. And the problem with that is I got bored and I got in trouble and I got in a lot of fist fights and I got expelled my senior year and then had to, you know, convince them to let me back in and then do night school. And just, you know, I didn't get to play my senior year of high school baseball because of that. And just you know, made a lot of bad decisions, got into drugs and drinking and all this crazy stuff. And, um, you know, ultimately I, I went to that network marketing meeting in 2001, thank God. And it, it wasn't that I made a lot of money. In fact, I spent more money than I made, but I learned a lot. And you mm -hmm. kind of touched on that, right? I learned about uh, developing myself into a better human, a better leader, uh, learning, you know, how to communicate, uh, how to be a business minded person and just thinking differently. Cause they didn't teach us this stuff in school. So uh, got into network marketing. The first company, unfortunately, went out of business. Uh, but I'll tell you what, I met Nadia, which was the biggest win of my life, of course, mm -hmm. right? Meeting my wife inside of that company. Um, and then uh, we took what we learned, Tim, and we went into the mortgage industry. And in the mortgage industry, back then, like, you know, the rates were low. Like, anybody, was, anybody could make money. You mm -hmm. didn't need a license. You didn't need a background, a degree, nothing. So this is um, what, 2004, 2005-ish? 2000. Four, and I remember, so the guy that, that and I don't want to go on a tangent on this, I tend to do that, but uh, the guy that got me a job, he dropped out of school also. He was going to an Ivy League school, dropped out to do mortgages, and he was just super sharp, super smart, my age. We just hit it off immediately as soon as we met each other, um, you know, just very like-minded. I remember he, he, so he brought his girlfriend to a meeting because uh, I had recruited her. She had a, her resume online. I invited her out to a meeting. And uh, she introduced me to her boyfriend, Tom, and Tom was driving an Escalade. And I'm like, bro, what do you do? You know, back then, like driving an Escalade was like a big deal. I'm like, yep. uh, and he's like, oh, I do mortgages. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't know what that is, but cool. Um, so, so he told me he thought I would be good at mortgages. And what happened was that first company we were in went out of business. Uh, my father pa passed away of a heart attack, which is why I'm so big into health and wellness and all that stuff, nutritional supplements. But he died of a heart attack. And then uh, Nadia got pregnant. So it was just like, boom, boom, boom. Company shut down, heart attack. You're having a baby at 23. Yeah. And uh, I was like, I got to get a real job. And this guy, Tom, thought I could make money selling these mortgage things. So I remember I went, in, went into the interview and I met with the owner. And he, he's like, uh, 
yeah, you know, I heard, you know, you're really great at this, that, and the other thing. And, and, you know, Tom spoke highly of you and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know what a mortgage is, Dave, but <laughs> I will outwork. I told him this, I don't know what a mortgage is, but I will outwork everybody in your company. Cause he said, if you make a hundred calls a day, you'll make six figures. And I just believed him. So mm -hmm. I literally made six, I, I made uh, 125,000 to be exact my first year. And that was only about, that was only within about 10 months. Cause I started in February between like March and, and the end of the year I made uh, 125,000. I was a rookie of the year. I made a hundred calls a day. If there was a day I made 70, I made 130 the next day. Like I was, dude, I'd go to the bathroom and I'd have like, you know, the little earpiece, you know, back then they had the electronics, I think it was called. Like I had the earpiece and people would try to talk to me to and from the bathroom or even while I'm like, you know, going to the bathroom. Like they're trying to talk to me. I'm like, bro, I'm, I'm on the phone 24 seven. Like I'm on the phone. I was so hungry to make money. And uh, the second year, I made two fifty. I was the number one loan officer at the company. And, and, uh, and feeling like, you know, John, like this is this is a really really powerful piece because yeah, <clears throat> it, something similar happened to me when I got involved in in real estate in 07, graduated, went out to New York City and people were like, dude, why would I list a property with you when I could list it with any of these brokers who know what they're doing? I was like, dude, because I have the work ethic. It doesn't matter right. what you need. If, if something, somebody gets locked out in the middle of the night, you call me, I promise you, nobody will work harder than I am. And I think when you lack skill, but you can make up for it in, mm -hmm. in you know, work ethic and determination and drive, dude, especially entrepreneurs, dude, they, you can't teach that. Right, that's not something that you can instill in other people. You can teach them the technical skill sets. You can't teach them the the drive and the attitude and the determination that you mm -hmm. really want in A players, right? And so, like that's something that, and, and early on, when you don't have the skills, when you get involved in a like a sales kind of job or something along those lines, like you you make up in numbers what you lack in skill, right? So, yeah. hey, even if somebody's been there for ten years and they can close, you know, six deals out of ten you could beat them by making a hundred phone calls. Even if you only close one deal out of 10, because if you make a hundred phone calls and they only make 10 phone calls, you're closing 10 deals. They're only closing six deals, right? So you make up in numbers what you lack in skill. And eventually you become more skillful that you eventually, yeah. you know, uh, develop the skill set. So that way year two, dude, you're closing two deals, four deals, seven deals out of 10, you know, powerful stuff. So I'm just wanting to unpack that real quick. So keep going, bud. Dude, you, you nailed it. I mean, that's it right there. I was like, I don't know what a mortgage is. I don't, but I'm just going to make more calls. I'm going to work harder. I'm hungrier than anybody. And then you start making all this money. And of course you start making bad investments. And you know, what's funny. I actually had a very good mindset in my opinion, because most of the people that were there were buying fancy cars, fancy suits. And dude, we're on the phone all day. I'm like, why do I need a suit? I don't even understand the purpose of a suit. I'm literally not meeting with clients, but they're, they're blowing their money any way they can. They're going out drinking. They're going, you know, these, these, these luxurious vacations. And I'm like, dude, I'm going to be smart. I remember having $150,000. Now, now imagine this. I'm a community college dropout. My parents never make money. Like, and I got $150,000 cash in my bank account. I remember looking at that number. Like I would always be looking at it. And I'm like, this is so sick, dude. Like I was like, you know, crazy excited. I'm like, I'm going to invest in real estate. I'm going to become a billionaire. I had it all mapped out. And unfortunately I bought at the peak of the market. I bought high. I sold low. I didn't have someone like you, unfortunately, that I could lean on and invest with and do all the things we're doing now. Mm -hmm. Um, but dude, I, <laughs> I lost all that money and I was like, I should have just blown it on luxurious vacations and <laughs> custom suits and nice cars. Like I should have blown it like everybody else. Cause it all went bye bye anyway. And that was a very stressful situation because not only that, but I deferred freaking taxes, which I forgot I did that. We deferred taxes. Nadia was also doing mortgages and crushing it uh, <clears throat> while, while raising Dylan. And so then we got to pay all this tax, the, all these taxes back. So we had to like have a monthly payment for years, paying thousands of dollars a month because I lost all the money that I would have given the government in those real estate investments. Mm -hmm. So, so that was like so stressful, but you know, at the what, end of the what day, kind of deals did you invest in? Uh, so flips, we were, we were trying yeah. to flip so and, and honestly, man, one, it was I, I speculative. Never you were, you were, you were buying at, at a retail price, hoping tomorrow it goes up to a higher price. Boom. Yeah. Hard. And then when it didn't, you didn't have the cash right. flow to cover all the debt service. You didn't have the cash flow to cover expenses and so right. didn't have the cash flow to fix the property, finish the property. And, and of course, you know, the deal, it's always supposed to finish sooner and cost less. Yep. And it always ends up costing way more and taking way longer. Yep. And, and then on top of that, man, I, don't, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know anything about real estate, right? I'm like leaning on a broke, 
I'll never forget this guy, Josh, that I did a lot of those investments with uh, because he knew a lot about real estate, but he was also broke. Like you never want to learn from someone that doesn't have money, right? They don't, right. it's like, if you're so smart and you're so great at this, Hey Nadia, I'm doing, doing an interview. Common sense. Um, <laughs> so, so for me, you don't have to edit out anything by the way. So, so for me, I was like, man, you know, I, like, I, I don't think real estate is for me. Like I lost all this money. I bought high, I sold low, plus the market crashed, right? And, and the truth is I figured out real quickly, like I need to be much more intelligent because it's so hard to make it. You work so hard to make it and to just, you know, blow it on stuff that you know nothing about. Like mm -hmm. you said, it's just speculation that it's going to appreciate and this is going to happen and that's going to happen. And, and it's funny too, because I heard a quote one time, actually two really good quotes. One, you shouldn't make money when you sell the property. You should be making money when you buy the property. I think that was Robert Kiyosaki. Um, and here I am talking about real estate quotes with the, the, the real estate it. guru, but you know the deal. It. You know the deal. Uh, and number two, uh, when a man with money meets a man with experience, the man with experience gets the money and the guy with the money gets the experience. Yes, and, and, that's, and that's exactly what happened. So, uh, you know, for us, you know, we, we lost a lot of money in real estate. And then, you know, on top of that, dude, I just... Mortgages, there's no personal development. Yeah. I mean, these guys aren't even reading books on, they're not even reading books on how to sell. Like, yeah. there's no, it, it was cutthroat. Everybody had a drinking or a drug problem or both. Boiler uh, it wasn't, room, just right? wasn't, it wasn't the best environment, honestly, the, the mortgage industry. And, you know, I didn't- Boiler room, Wolf of Wall Street type of, type of mindset, right? A hundred percent like boiler room. Mm -hmm. Wolf of Wall Street, all that. Yes, yes, yes. And it was, you know what it was, dude? It was all about, and looking back, I feel guilty. But back then, it was all about how much money can you make on the single deal? They literally would have a leaderboard of who's charging the most money in fee, essentially. That's how you made your money. And looking back, it's like, no wonder it got regulated. No wonder it crashed. No wonder they, they started uh, uh, you know, forcing us to get licensed. And, and when they started forcing, forcing uh, licensing and, and all these other things, I'd also got back into network marketing. Uh, with the company we met in, that was in 2006. So it's it's interesting because I just came off my biggest financial year ever. I made 250, invested in all that real estate, and then I get back into network marketing. I, I only say it's funny because so many people assume when someone's making a lot of money, they're not open to other income streams. And on the contrary, uh, when someone's making a lot of money, they realize that they need to be smart because they're working so hard and they only have one stream of income and they've created a lifestyle and uh, you know you start to become dependent on a certain level of income, but it's also scary when it's only one source because you know, especially when you're in sales, you're in a, a, a business that goes up, up, has so many ups and downs. I mean, mm -hmm. mortgages fluctuates like crazy. I mean, you you can make a ton of money when the rates are down, but you can also make nothing when the rates go up, and that's that's just something that I, I didn't want to be in a business like that long term with so much stress, so much emotion. You could work on a deal for six months, two years, and you get to the closing table. And because the underwriter messed up or someone, someone makes a mistake, someone says something they shouldn't say, the deal dies. Mm -hmm. And I just, I had to get out of that business. So that's when I got back into network marketing, uh, did it part-time for a couple years. And then 2008, I went full-time and I've been full-time in network marketing uh, since 2000, yes, 2008. So over 11 years now. Mm -hmm. It's been crazy. It's wild, man. Yeah. So. So you're in that company. Uh, I, I, was in, I was in that company for about two and a half, maybe three years. And then I got back into real estate, right? Um, dude, got so much mindset, so much personal development. I, I remember being terrified to do a testimonial early on, like publicly Same. speak. And then by the end of it, I was like, no, I'm going to be the next Tony Robbins and like all this kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah. Like I yeah. love what it did for, for me as an individual. But like you said, man, I spent way more money going out and, and burning up the tires and the miles on my car and doing these meetings and all that oh. kind of stuff. And for me, it just didn't, uh, that business wasn't congruent with, with what my long-term vision and stuff was anyway. So I got back into real estate and, uh, burned up the trails in real estate and you moved over to a different company that you just aligned with a little bit better. Why was that? Yeah. I mean, for, for me, you, you hit the nail on the head again, man. It's, that was, that was it. I was, I was terrified of public speaking I had a deep, deep fear got over that. And then, you know, now I'm out every night doing meetings. And, and I was there seven years, uh, you know, full time for five, and I actually made six figures five years in a row. I mean, the year I went full time, I started recruiting a players, business owners, entrepreneur minded people, people that spoke the language, people with influence, 
Yep. Uh, and that's when my business blew up, actually. That was 2008. So I made six figures, 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12 as a full-time network marketer. And then, so that was seven years total in that business. I'd completely got at, gotten out of mortgages, right? I did my last loan in February 2008 for my mom to lock her into a 30-year mortgage, and then I was done. Um, but you know, and actually you got out of it before everything crumbled then, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what I also had a personal thing happen. One of my, my best friends from high school, we'd kind of gone in different directions, but he was still, you know, one, like a brother to me. He committed suicide. He had a drug problem, you know, shot himself like a whole like horrible thing that happened. And I quit drinking after that because him and I always would be like, we get drunk, you know, three in the morning, like, dude, we should really quit drinking. Like we make all the bad decisions after, you know, We've drank too much midnight. Like some people can have a glass of wine. They're cool. Just chill. You know, for me, it's like a couple bottles, right? A couple, yep. you know, a 30 pack. Like, you know, we just, we were crazy. So I quit drinking and I said, you know what? I'm not going to do this mortgage thing. I need to get out of this. I need to do something positive. I need to do something that I'm excited about. And I just got really excited about network marketing full time. And I was like, I'm going to go out there and do meetings every night. I'm going to recruit better people. I'm going to take this serious. I'm going to take my life more seriously. You know, and you got a kid. I had another one on the way. Uh, you know, so we had Christina in October, 2008. So she's now, uh, going to be 11 next month at the time of this recording. So I have a 15 year old son. Uh, my daughter is in fifth grade. It's just crazy. Dude, time flies. Know, right? but bottom line for me, that company, because I had two kids, because I, it was like nobody on my team making money. Like they would make money for a little while and then it would die off. So I'm like, okay, I've been here seven years. I'm out doing meetings every night, every night. And they're not up the road, bro. You know the deal. It's like you're driving two hours one way to do two a hours. 630 meeting. And then your 830 meeting is an hour away from the 630 meeting. You're getting home after midnight eating crap food. Like, I'm like, this is not what I signed up for. I'd rather go back to doing mortgages yeah. than to be out every single night doing these PBRs, private business receptions, pitching people on a business that we're calling a home business but I'm never home. I'm in other mm -hmm. people's homes. I'm doing a Saturday training every Saturday. In fact, we had my daughter on a Tuesday and my daughter was 10 pounds, two ounces for, for some of us that have had kids, you know, that's a big, big baby. Mm -hmm. Nadia was at Saturday training before the baby and Saturday training that Saturday, dude. Like that's oh how psychotic gosh. we were, but Hey, they say you got to be crazy. If you want to have crazy success, make crazy money. And I agree with that, but you also have to have some common sense. And if you feel like you're not aligned with the direction of the business you're in, like you don't, you don't feel like excited when you wake up in the morning, you're not excited about which, like, what's the point? Like, mm -hmm. okay, so I'm making some money. It was super scary at the time to cut, to, to, to cut off that income and just say, you know what, I'm done. But I couldn't look people in the eye anymore and say, this is a great opportunity. So I started building something else yep. and that was in 2013. And then of course, so more so, drama so came after that, but I, I left that company in July of 2013. It was the best decision yeah. I have made, especially at that time, because we've gone on to have huge success. But dude, it was it was hard, man. It was hard at that time to walk away on something. You know, you think about something you've done for even two years, you know, five years. This was seven years of a long time, man. Twenty four so, seven crazy work ethic. So there's the a, sweat equity. There's a couple things walk. that you talked about. There is is uh. And, and a couple of times you're like, Hey, I got to get out of mortgages and find something better. Okay. So you think this is better over here. You get onto that side of the grass. Maybe the grass isn't necessarily greener, which you found out. And it took a lot of watering, it took seven years of watering that grass. And then you still realize it's not greener grass. Right. So then you leave again. And at what point are you like, okay, this is the right opportunity. It's not the right opportunity. Or I'm, I'm going to stop looking at, you know, different types of uh, dangly, shiny objects and, and uh, stop looking at grass is greener on the other side. Like, what have you learned from that whole process? Well, first of all, the company that I felt like was the better option, it wasn't just the company, it was also the, it was the timing. It was the, the way they built their businesses online because I wanted to build online. I wanted to build from home. I wanted to be, a, you know, be able to put my kids to bed and not yeah. have someone else putting my kids to bed, right? Like, so, so for me, it was, I tried to build that business online from home it just it wasn't possible with the, the way the model was set up and they still don't really build it that way they still those guys still build offline so but it, it's crazy because i didn't want to have shiny ball syndrome i didn't want to look like a like a hopper like i just you know on to the next thing but then of course that company gets shut down by the ftc <laughs> so you're like all right maybe i'm maybe this is like something that's not meant to be like i'm not meant to be a network marketer but then i was also like okay well maybe this is maybe this is for the best because 
that company, I also ended up signing up under a guy that was just a scumbag and he was taking advantage of my team. And there was just all these other things going on. I had a lawsuit from the previous company. It was actually, when I look back, you know, you, when you look at your life in reverse, you realize things happen for you, not to you. And yep. you're like, thank God that happened. But at the time, again, it's like, you know, I consuming, left something dude. I it's built all for consuming. seven you years. You can't see outside of that, right? Right, right. It, it, and it's hard when you're in it, when you're in the thick of it, right? Like it's hard. Nadia always says, it's hard to see the picture when you're in the frame, right? Mm -hmm. So so when we were going through that second huge like letdown, right? Like the company shut down. I'm losing a six-figure income. 7,000 people had enrolled with us all over the world within two years and just wow. boom, gone. But here's the good news. In 2013, we also started building a personal brand. We started creating other income streams. We yep. started building an audience. You know, we've got tens of thousands of people around the world that follow us and, you know, listen to our content, our training. We sell info products. We started doing affiliate marketing and creating our own physical products and, you know, basically creating our own economy. So we didn't need to rely on just a network marketing income stream. And look, traditional businesses go out of business, a network marketing business, anything can, can happen. So it just makes sense to have multiple income streams. Even if you're making millions of dollars, it's still one income stream. Why not diversify or invest or create another backup, right? We, we always talk about uh, health insurance, life insurance, car insurance, home insurance. Nobody has income insurance, right? They have this one job. It's mostly employees that have this mindset. They have one job, one income stream. They lose that job. They literally can't pay their bills. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for us, we, we lost that income, which sucked, but- I had, you know, my brand. So it's not like I couldn't pay my bills. It's not, I mean, we were making six figures with our brand. So we weren't like destitute. And I ended up launching the business I'm with now four years ago. And we became millionaires in this company. And I don't think we would have became millionaires in the previous one we were in. So even though it sucked at the time, having that company get shut down, I think that was all meant to be. And I think if it didn't happen the way it did, the exact way it did, we wouldn't be where we are having huge success. You know, we, in 2017, uh, we started making six figures a month. Uh, at the end of that year, we, we, you know, we got in the uh, MLM hall of fame for, uh, you know, becoming a million dollar earner. We got in the top 100 income earners in all of network marketing, uh, you know, started, you know, making some, some serious money. And actually, over the summer, the slow, slow months, right? They always say in network marketing with, with my type of business that it's like, that's the slow time. Well, June, July, and August, all three months were bigger than any month we've ever had in our career. Wow. And they were, they, we did over 11 million in sales. And it's, it's, it's been crazy, man. But just this past, this past three months. Yeah, just literally June, July, August. So wow. um, it was it was it was a wild ride, but it, it got us to where we are today. And you know, I, I heard a quote on a podcast just a couple months ago, and I thought it was so good. It's like, you know, when do you know you've gotten a great workout? It's when you're sore the next day. Mm -hmm. Pain, right? You feel that pain, mm -hmm. right? That's also life, right? How do you know? You're having a great life and you know, you're, you're experiencing joy because you've had pain. You have something to compare it to. You know, yeah. like this, that was a good workout, dude. Like I'm freaking, like, I can't move, right? You, leg day, the next day, you're like, you know, you're, you're walking around with a limp. Like, you, you know, you just want to like sit and just, you know, not move. So that's how you know you got a good workout. It's the same in life, right? So when you have the pain and you have the adversity, it's like, you, you must just have a higher calling. Like you wouldn't go to the movies to go see a, a crap movie with no drama. There's no, there's no plot twist. Like this is, this movie sucks. Like right. nobody would, you wouldn't even make that movie. Right. Yeah. So, so when you're going through it, it's hard to stay positive and, and have faith that things, things will work out and this too shall pass. But um, you know, obviously the one thing we did not do, we did not quit. We kept going we kept persevering even when we didn't feel like it, even when we were questioning things. And, and, and you know, it's not even true. I probably did quit Tim. I just didn't tell anybody. Yeah. <laughs> like I quit for like a day, like, you know, freaking done. Like I'm just, you know, I'm going to feel sorry for myself today, but I wouldn't tell anyone. Thank God. I wouldn't go on Facebook and be like, I'm so done with this because I knew that every success story I had written, I had, I had, uh, you know, written about written, is that word? every, every success story I'd read, right. Every time you saw someone speak on stage, Every time, any, any success story, there's always adversity. There's always drama. There's always a freaking mm -hmm. plot twist. So it's, it's all 
how we perceive it. And I know you know that. That's why you've had so much success in your business. But to expect it to be easy and expect everybody to support you and expect to always make profits and, and have no ebbs and flows like your business, you just get started and it just goes up forever. Like, first of all, everybody's going to hate you if that does happen, right? Mm -hmm. Like everybody's going to, nobody's going to relate to a story like that. Yep. So I think all that stuff worked out the way it was supposed to. And you know, what's interesting too. I'm actually glad I didn't make this much money when I was younger. You know, I'm glad it took so long because now I appreciate it. Like the people yep. I work with, people on my team, like they love us. Like they, they appreciate and respect us. They're blown away by us all the time. Like I get so many messages with people just appreciating that we respond to their messages, that we know their names, that we treat them like a human. We look them in the eye. We talk, you know, and obviously I don't do a lot of like offline stuff, but when I do, like I take pictures with everyone, right? Yeah. Because I know to them, they're looking at me, but not looking at me. They're looking at what's possible. It inspires right. them of what their life could be. And I don't take it for granted, but I, I think if I would have made a lot, lot of money, if I would have made the money I'm making now at a younger age, I would not have appreciated it. Yep. My ego would have been way bigger. Mm -hmm. I, there would be no humility. There'd be no, I just, I think I would have been like, I'm the one that made this happen. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Like, because of my ish, yep. I did this. Instead, I'm like, dude, this isn't about me. Yeah. I know damn well what I had to go through to get here. Yep. And I don't want it to ever go backwards. But I also know it's not about me just like holding on, right? It's about me having an abundant mindset. It's about me being grateful. It's about me being uh, more strategic with what I do with my money, which I know we're going to talk about. And I think all of that just, just set the foundation for who I was meant to become. But thank God I didn't quit. And thank God I stayed positive. Thank God I kept working hard, even through all the adversity. Do you feel like you're at a point now... Uh, because early on, man, it, it's hard to make money, right? It's hard to kind of figure out how to generate revenue and- Especially consistently. Right. Like and, you might have like one big win, one big hit, and then it's like, dude, this is so hard. How do I just every month make it come in, right? Yep. And, and what have you found is, is one, what, what creates the consistency, right? And then two- I found that's, that's very value driven, right? Like the more value you give, like it's the whole, the whole reaping and what you sow kind of a thing. Right. And the more value you give, the more people respond to that and the more opportunity that then presents itself. Do you feel like today, if, if for any reason your other business got shut down, this, this, this network marketing company that you're in right now, if it got shut down, would you be stressed out or would you say, Hey, now I know how to do this. I know how to create enough value and how to create enough, um, or how to overcome all that adversity. And I've kind of figured out how to put the puzzle pieces together in order to generate revenue. Now, do you think like you got to that point? Yeah. Oh, 100%. And it's funny because <clears throat> I listen to Gary Vee and sometimes I don't want to listen to him because I'm like, that was so good. And I'm like, I don't even want to think what he just said, but he's like, you know, sometimes I, I wish my business would just go to zero. So I could just rebuild it all over again. Yeah. And I feel like sometimes I actually think that too. And I'm like, I don't want that. I don't even want to think that because I've got people that they've created phenomenal incomes and phenomenal businesses for them and their family. So I would never want that to happen. But I do sometimes think like, what if I, you know, started my own company or what if, what if I had to rebuild, like, how would I do it differently? So of course, if you've done it a couple times, your confidence and your experience is there. So you, you feel like it wouldn't be as hard the second time around. Yep. Uh, so, so I definitely agree with that. And I think creating consistent income to answer that question, I think it just boils down to you showing up first consistently, right? Like you said, providing value, uh, pouring into people. Every day. Yeah. And, every day. And, 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 and you know what? Even if you show up consistently for two years, that doesn't mean you're going to make money, but that means you kind of talked about it, right? You're, you're, you're reaping what you sow and you're out there going, you know what? I'm not seeing the results. And I always say this word, I think it's so important yet. If I write a book, it might just call it yet. Because if something isn't where you want it to be, you're just not there yet, right? You're not, you're not in the best relationship yet. You haven't met the, the man or woman of your dreams, or you haven't had kids yet, or you haven't, uh, you know, become a, a successful business person yet, right? Whatever that looks like. Everybody has a different definition of success, by the way. Like, I thought I needed to make millions of dollars because I didn't feel worthy. I didn't, right? And then you make it and you're like, I don't feel that different. I mean, I'm right. grateful. It's awesome. I can do more. I have freedom. Mm -hmm. But you still have to work on this thing right here. This yeah. this thing in between your ears. 
even with the money I'm making, all the success, sometimes I still question my abilities. I still question if I can continue down this path, right? And I, I think that's just called being human. Mm -hmm. So just embrace the suck, embrace those tough times, go, hey, I, I am showing up consistently, Tim. I'm still not getting results. Okay, yet. You just keep doing it. Mm -hmm. The only person that fails, and we know this, it's the one that quits, mm -hmm. right? I've never met a network marketing failure. I met network marketing quitters, mm -hmm. right? Same thing could be said in any business. Same thing could be said in real estate. You know, you get mm -hmm. people, oh, I, I, like me, I bought high, I sold low. Does that mean real estate doesn't work? No, that means I made some bad decisions. Just because someone gets divorced doesn't mean marriage doesn't work. Just because someone drops out of school doesn't mean you can't get a degree and go find a great job. It wasn't for me, but to each their own. And you just have to identify like, what do I want with my life? What do I want to turn this into? And, and map out a freaking plan to do it and stick to the plan no matter what. And that was Love the that. thing for me. It's like, okay, one company sucked. So I walked away. They wouldn't, they wouldn't embrace social media. They wouldn't learn from all their mistakes. They've made so many mistakes. They wouldn't change. Okay. I'm just going to go find something else to do. Oh, that company got shut down. That sucked also, <laughs> but it's like, all right, on to the next one. I don't want to just get stuck in woe is me as if I'm the only one with problems. We all have problems, right? And, and if you go out there complaining about your problems, well, here's the deal. Half the people that you complain to, they don't care. The other half are glad it's happening to you. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I went on a tangent. Sorry. I love it, dude. No, that's phenomenal stuff. And, and I think one of the things that people don't realize is it's a compound effect, right? Like you're yes. freaking out your business mindset, you're working out your business. It's, it's every single day and you're putting in the reps, right? It's like going to the gym every day for 30 days and nobody sees a difference. You don't even see a difference in your body. And then it's not till 60 days, 90 days later that maybe you see a little bit of a, of a different effect. No. And you've been going through the no. pain. You've been going through the, the struggles. You've been going like your muscles are sore and like you can't sit upright and everything hurts all the time and, <laughs> and you still can't see the results. And it's not no. until six months later that somebody's like, John, hey, you look a little, a little more trim, dude. You're looking good. Yeah. But dude, yeah. I've been beating my own ass for the past six months and you're just now seeing yeah. the results. Yeah. That's life, right? That's everything. Yeah, right. you do. But it's consistency on a daily basis over and over and over again priming the pump and eventually it gets to a place where you know now you don't have to put in that two hour effort every single day you just got to give it a good 30 45 minutes and you can sustain mm -hmm. and maintain you know and i think a lot of people don't realize that but it's a, it's that compound effect that you know darren hardy's book compound effect check it yeah. out it's an amazing book and amazing message and i i think it's so true in every aspect of creating that consistency in life and and you got to you got to be willing to put in the work on the front end in order to reap the, reap the results. People, you know, they see the results that I've had over the past two, three years and they're like, Oh my goodness, how, how have you been able to do that? I'm like, dude, cause I've been shoveling shit for 11 years. That's why. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You didn't, you didn't, nobody said anything good about me the first eight years that I was in real estate. It's only been the past three, you know? So it's um, well, hundred percent, man. You, I totally you, know what you, you nailed it, dude. That that's the biggest challenge though with social media. Mm -hmm. We get compareitis. We mm -hmm. start comparing our, front yard to someone's backyard or vice versa. We're comparing somebody's chapter 10 to our chapter one, or we're comparing, you know, well, this person, uh, they're, they're, they're really great at, uh, you know, doing videos or podcasting, or they're really great at this, that, that. but you don't realize they're just great at that thing, but you might be great at something that they're not. It, mm -hmm. and, and that's, and that's the biggest challenge I see with social media is we're all caught up with keeping up with the Joneses and you're following these people that, that, you know, they, they got their own jet, right? So now you're a loser because you don't have a jet or you don't have that nice car. They do. And, you know, what's wrong with me? I must be doing something wrong. And it's said, you haven't paid a price. You're trying to withdraw from an empty bank account, literally. And, and you're not building up that social equity. You haven't done enough to deserve that level of success. And the problem is, and this is what I found, if you make it too soon, if you end up achieving success early on, you actually become quite insecure. Mm -hmm. right? And you make bad decisions with your money and you make bad decisions with your relationships because you're almost setting yourself up for failure because you don't have enough, you don't, you don't have enough gratitude for, like you said, you had to like, you know, get your hands dirty for eight years. So once you got there, it was like, okay, now I get why it took so long because yeah. now you have all this experience and knowledge that without that eight years of struggle, you, you couldn't have, you couldn't have 
handled the success that you got year nine, 10, 12, 15, you couldn't have handled that success without the suffering and the adversity. So I think that's so crucial. And, and, and even though I'll say this kind of stuff all the time, you probably say this stuff all the time and every guest you have in your podcast talks about this. It's still like, mm -hmm, yeah, whatever. Like I'm still, you know, pissed off and I'm, I'm, I'm not where I want to be. And it's like, you know what, the sooner you snap out of that stinking thinking and you show up with energy, with excitement, with positivity, and you start to step into that greatness, it will happen sooner. Yep. And it, it's easier said than done. But how are you showing up every day? Because most of us don't really go all in. And that's, that's part of the reason I feel it took me so long, because I was afraid. I was afraid to fail. I was afraid of what people would think. And we're so caught up in this analysis paralysis or this, this fear, right? We've all heard that fear stands for false evidence appearing real. And we think like, what are these people going to think about me? Well, what if I go all in? It doesn't work. You know, what about this? What about that? And, and, and I understand it. But if you're thinking about it and you can't stop thinking about it, that means you have to freaking take the plunge. You're, you're meant to do big things. And I feel like, you know, I was terrified of public speaking. Same with you. And now you're a great speaker. I feel like I've gotten pretty good at this, right? We just spoke at an event with 2,000 people and we were the keynotes to close out the conference, my wife and I. Awesome. And, you know, we, we, we know that we wouldn't have been there without all that struggle. Nobody wants to hear a success story of like, yeah, I got in. Everybody said yes. Uh, I invested money, <laughs> made millions. And, and, you know, and then that person actually ends up super insecure. They know they don't deserve to sit at the table with everybody else. Yep. Right. So it, 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 you got to go out there and earn that ish. And when you do and you finally get a seat at the table, you're gonna be like, I belong here. Yep. I, I know what I did to get here. Yep. In fact, I worked harder than most of y'all. Mm -hmm. So when people complain to me and they're frustrated, I'm like, do you think that this is like an abnormal thing? Like your trials and tribulations are rare and unusual. Like this is all very normal it's yeah. far for the course, baby. And when I start telling them my stuff, they're like, Oh, I'm like, exactly. I don't want to hear any complaints. Like if you went through what I went through, that would have blown you out. You would have quit a long time ago. So I just think all of us have to realize that it's, it's, it's all in due process. It's all, it's all part of the process and don't get too caught up on comparitis, man. Just stay in your lane, you know, get, get inspired by others right? Maybe put, put a little pressure on yourself because you know, when you watch Tim and you watch some of these other people that you're watching, you know, you could do more, but don't allow that to discourage you. That right. should encourage you to work harder, work on yourself also, right? We talked a little bit about personal development. I think a lot of people, thank God we did network marketing at young ages. You know, you're, it sounds like you started pretty young too. Yep. Um, I'm so thankful I was exposed to personal development because I didn't realize how much I needed to check up from the neck up. I didn't know how significant that was, right? I was, I was playing the blame game. I had excuseitis. I had all this stuff going on. But what I didn't realize, it was all, it was all a problem up here. So. Yeah. No, man, I think that's powerful. And I think what you said about comparing yourself to other people, like everybody does it, especially in the age of social media. And what I tell everybody that, that I talk to is like, listen, you can't compare yourself to somebody else, right? You don't know what, exactly what you said, John. You don't know what they've gone through. You don't know what they were set up, what kind of resources and connections that they have. There's people comparing me to like Grant Cardone. Like when are you going to have a billion? Like, dude, Grant Cardone's got 28 years on me. You know, like, like no. I, how, how am I supposed to be able to like, I'll get He's there. He's been in real estate almost as long as you've been alive. Exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. And, and you know what's funny? Grant's a great example. He's frustrated because he's not a billionaire yet because he's comparing himself to billionaires. Exactly. Right? Like, we're, there's always somebody doing better than you. And even if they're doing better than you financially, what if they have like, you know, a serious health problem? Yep. What if their spouse has a serious health problem? What if they're, who cares how wealthy you are if your kids are sick? I mean, it's yep. like, dude, we're all human. We all got stuff. Just stop with the, oh, I wish I was this. I wish I was further along. And again, we're all guilty of it. But the sooner you, you, Eliminate the stick and thinking as soon as you'll be where you want. And here's the thing, man. You can only compare yourself. The only fair comparison that can be made is where you were a year ago and where you are today. And where you are today to where you're going to be a year from now. That's the only fair, true comparison that you should be comparing yourself to. Is are you advancing yourself physically, emotionally, relationally, mm -hmm. financially, spiritually? Are you getting better and being your best day in, day out, and getting 1% better every single day. And if you are, like, that's the only comparison you can make. I know that I'm a better person today than I was a year ago. I know that I can face 
greater adversities and greater struggles today than I could a year ago because I've been working on myself the entire time. And that gives me a lot of confidence and able to go and take on more, more struggles and more, more uh, issues and more business transactions and problems and, and opportunities and all those other things. And so you do not compare yourself to other people, only compare yourself to you, where you started, where you are now, where you're going, you know? Right. So good stuff. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention is just, you know, especially real estate, like real estate's not an experiment. So like you're saying, yeah. you're just not there yet, right? Like I knew that real estate would eventually make me a millionaire, right? I knew that eventually I would get there because there were so many people. Real estate's been around forever and it's not some sort of experiment. It's not some sort of tech startup or something along those lines. It's, it's been around and it's, I knew it would eventually work, right? And so um, I just kept putting my head down, man. Didn't look left, didn't look right, just kept on working. And I knew eventually it would pay off. If I put in enough time, if I overcame enough struggles and adversities and, and uh, problems. And, and eventually every time I, I faced one of those struggles or failures, I got a little bit stronger, a little bit better, and was able to take on more of that stuff uh, on yeah. an ongoing basis. So good, good stuff, man. So let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about some of the uh, some of the bad investments you've made. So you talked a little bit about buying real estate at its peak, hoping, speculating that it would go up in value, and then it didn't. What other things have you invested in that that did not play out the, the way that you had hoped? Well, it's interesting too because back then everybody was making money in real estate, and that's you know I I don't remember where I first heard it, but we've all heard the thing like you know if you're if you're you know Uber driver back then it was probably taxi cab, but if they're giving you advice on investments, that's when you know it's not. A good yeah, time to invest, right? Run. Like, so right. everybody was making money in real estate, and I remember saying to Nadia, "We bought a townhome back then in our early twenties for like four fifty, and I'm just like, I'm looking at the mortgage payment, and I'm like, you know, we can afford this, but like, we are making a lot of money at a young age in mortgages, right? And I'm like, I don't know, man. I'm like, how much more can this really go up? And she's yeah. like, Oh, baby, it'll be fine. It was not fine. It <laughs> ruined our credit. It definitely depreciated over a hundred thousand. But again, you know, it's 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 you know. Everybody was jumping on the real estate investing bandwagon and everything kept going up. And that's obviously nowadays, it's an indicator that it's, it's time to sell. <laughs> yep. But I was in my early 20s and I was trying to be smart with my money. And obviously I was not. But uh, yeah, that was, that was uh, an early bad experience of investing. And, and I would say we learned a lot from that. But still, we ended up investing in cryptocurrency. And we actually did make money with crypto. So I shouldn't completely negate that. I mean, we did make money. But uh, then we reinvested it and eventually it crashed. It's funny because I remember when it got up to like 19,000 per Bitcoin. And I was like, we should at least sell enough to get our investment back. And, and we didn't. I don't know why. And then it kept crashing. And it's like, you know, all the way down to like whatever it was, 4,000 at one point. I think it's back up since then. But it, the thing I figured out about crypto, and we still have like one Bitcoin, I believe, just in case one day that Bitcoin is worth $1 million. Yeah, yeah. But I think the problem with cryptocurrency or any investment actually is that I'm not an expert and I don't care to pay attention. I don't, you know what it is? I don't care to be an expert in crypto. I don't want to, I don't want to hear about it. I don't, I don't, okay, great. It becomes, you know, worth millions of dollars and you should have held on to it for 30 years. I don't even think I'll have FOMO about that mm -hmm. because I don't care about it. And I wish I never got into it only because, I got so sucked into it, not financially, but I was spending so much time researching that and, mm -hmm. and blockchain and all this stuff, which may or may not become huge. But guess what? There's always something that may or may not become huge. And for me, you hit the nail on the head. Real estate is never, there's never going to be a time where we don't need to live somewhere. Yep. There's never going to be a time where we don't have homes. If there's a time where nobody has real estate anymore, that's a time where probably none of us are even alive, right? Yeah. Like that's the end of the world or we're, this is hundreds of years from now. So, so you can build legacy wealth with real estate. And to me, it just makes sense to invest with people that know what they're doing because that's mm -hmm. not a freaking expert, right? So to me, I don't want to buy some little shithole, fix it up, make a buck, but have to spend my time. Yep. My time, if you think you're a millionaire and you're just not, you know, the check hasn't caught up, right? Like you're not a millionaire yet, like in, in money, but mindset, like, you know, you're gonna be a millionaire. You got to look at your time differently. My time is valuable. Like an hour to me is a thousand, two thousand, potentially thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. So to spend all that time collecting rent 
and fixing up the property or hiring someone to fix the property, which cuts into the pro I don't have time for that, dude. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not going to pretend to know. I'm not going to go. I'm just going to go, hey, Tim, I trust you. You've made a lot of money in real estate and you do it the right way. You think like I think I'm going to invest with your investments. Mm -hmm. I want to partner with you. Sure. Maybe I could have made more with that money if I did it myself, but I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Number one, number two, you gotta go through the learning curve take, of it then dude. You know, right? like, the time it's going to take for me to do it, it actually ends up meaning I do make less money because yeah. you're not looking at your time as your most valuable asset. I can lose a million bucks. Mm -hmm. I can get it back. I can't lose a minute and get it back. I can't lose a day, an hour, a month and get it back. It's gone. Mm -hmm. So that's our most valuable asset. So to me, sure, I would love to like invest a hundred thousand and it turns into a million in a year. But in my experience, and we went to a Tony Robbins business mastery event for five days. We've studied and read all these books and actually Nadia does most of that. Thank God. I outsourced the learning. Um, and then she shares with me the biggest takeaways um, or a really important, like, you know, read this specifically. And, and if you look at the biggest investors in the world, they all talk about just, you know, making five, 10, 15% of your money. Like you know, don't go for the big wins. Don't go for the big, you know, like, Oh, if I invest in this, I make 40%. Maybe when maybe. the money leaves your bank account, there's a chance it ain't coming back. That's how I look at it. Dude, a lot maybe, of people take a look at, at return, return on investment. How about return of investment, right? How about making sure you get your money back like that? is more right. important than the return on What's it. rule number one? What's Warren Buffett's rule number one? Never lose principal. Don't lose money, right? Don't lose money. And then rule number two, go back to rule number one. Yeah. So I, like, okay, the, I loud and clear billionaire. Yep. yep. <laughs> Richest man in the world or top five, whatever. Yep. Like don't lose money. I just can't invest in things that, you know, I heard uh, Ed Milet said he lost $5 million because he invested in someone that he really, really believed in. He goes, but the business didn't make sense. He goes, I've invested in businesses that made sense, but the person wasn't a good person. He's like, you got to invest in things where it's a, it's a good investment, makes sense, with what you do, makes a ton of sense. Mm -hmm. And then good people, you're a good person. I trust you. I've known you for years. I've seen you show up every day. You're not, you're not. You know, you're not like hiding from the public. You're not like, you know, getting people that, you know, sucka, right? Like you're doing what you're doing and you're talking about it. You're, you're sharing your experience. You're, you're, you're out there in the world being about what you're speaking about. And I think there's too many people out there that, that, you know, they can regurgitate, they can do a good job, but they're not, they're not living it. They're not doing what they're teaching and yeah. preaching. Well, really, that's what it is. It's preaching. There's just, you know, they read a good book, they watch your video, they watch my video, and then they go regurgitate, but yeah. they're not out there actually doing what they're talking. Anyway, I go on a tangent about that all day, but yeah, so there's I think real, that, estate, yeah. real estate and investing with people that know what the heck they're doing. I love that. I love it. Yeah. I, I think, um, from an investment standpoint, have you ever read the book Richest Man in Babylon? Uh, yeah, long yeah. years ago. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's all about, you know, like, I don't know, one of the people in there, he invests a bunch of money to go with like somebody who's the shoemaker, you know, the, the town cobbler or whatever they are. And they, uh, and this guy's gonna go and invest in a bunch of gems. Like what the hell do you, does the shoemaker know about investing in gems and gold Nothing. and diamonds and all these other things? He doesn't know anything, but he, you know, so why would I go invest with somebody who doesn't do that on a full, like if they wanted to expand their shoe business, I'd be much more inclined right. to invest with that person because they know that business. They don't know anything about this other business. They haven't gone through the 10,000 hours to become an expert at mm. that business, you know? And here's the real problem. If you do make money, now you think you're bulletproof. Yeah. Now, and that's, I don't remember where I, I heard that, but the guy talks about, it. he's like, you know, the problem with actually making a lot of money on your investment and, and doing something risky is now you get addicted to it. Now you think, oh, it's not a good investment unless I can make like 50%, yeah. unless I can make my, unless I can make like 20% return per month. Yeah. And it's like, okay, but yeah. that eventually will come back to bite you. In fact, you're probably going to end up, make, you're, it's like a gambler, right? They, they go to the casino and they make a ton of money. They make like a hundred grand in a weekend or something. Mm -hmm. Now that person will be addicted to that high to that rush the rest of their life and they will end up becoming an addict and they will absolutely lose the hundred thousand in a whole and so much more because they got addicted to that high return as if it's normal anyway no and i think one of the things that people don't realize or they don't understand is that interest rates rate and return on investment is reflective of risk right yeah and like we we pay a pretty a very respectable return on our deals but that's because we, we as a 
as an operator, we take on a lot of responsibility. We, we do, we create appreciation because we, one, we find off market direct to seller deals. And two, we force the appreciation because of the sweat equity that we put into these. Right. So it's a, it's a shitload of work in order to create that. And I know that if I can force the appreciation, force the, the equity, create the equity over the course of 12 or maybe 18 months, I can swap out and pay my investors back. So that's why I'm able to pay somebody like you 10%, right? And, and I'm able to arp, like, like blend that, the total cost of capital. If I'm going out and getting uh, a loan on this apartment building next door to me right now, and the bank's willing to give me a 5% interest rate, right? On 80% of the money. And then I go, I go to you and you give me the other 20% of the money and I pay you 10 or 15% interest on that. The total cost of my of the money to me, if you blend it all out, because I'm paying 5% on 80% of the money, I'm paying, let's say 10% on the other 20% of the money, it's only 6% overall, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm buying it at the right price and I'm creating appreciation versus speculating on it, I can pay a little bit higher of an interest rate to my investors, especially because I know it's only a short period of time. So it makes right. sense for them, it makes sense for me, give you a little bit of equity and perpetuity after you get all your money back. And guess what? Then you see me as a great long-term partner. And we can just right. keep on doing more and more deals. And over the next 10 years, dude, we do six, seven, eight different deals together. And, um, and both of us are building real wealth that way. Right. And you made a good return. Right. And um, I think it's, I think it's a good thing. One of the things I've always realized. Well, and you also make sure your investors are making money where there's, there's, there's some organizations out there where they're like, Hey, if the, the investor makes money, that's, you know, hopefully they do, but I'm making mine. I'm going to yeah. get mine. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and that creates, I think a, a uh, relationship that won't last long term. It's a short term, you know, they're making, that, that investor will probably make money because they're just, you know, they're very good at what they do. And, you know, but at the end of the day, if, if the people that are investing with you aren't making money, why would they continue to invest? And then you have to go find new business. So and, and, I, I and what I see is interests aren't aligned in a lot of other things, right? Like, some syndicators, people who invest in apartment buildings, they take their acquisition fee. You know, they take yeah. an asset management fee. They take oh, some yeah. fund management financing fee before the investors ever get a dime. I don't take any money until my investors get 100% of their money back and they're making money while their money's in play, you know? So what I found is one, investors want a, a predictable return on their investment, right? They don't want it to go up and down, especially an A player, somebody who's a successful entrepreneur like you, like, I want to know what I'm going to make on my money versus, you know, I'm going to make 1% this month and then it, or 1% this year and then 8% and then 15%. And it's just, it's too volatile, right? Yeah. Like we take enough risk in our own primary business where now if you're going to go and invest in something, you want something predictable and um, uh, something that's just going to offer a predictable return on your investment, right? But at the same yeah. time, you want some sort of upside, right? If you're going to help, if Tim's going to make a million bucks on this deal, I want some of that upside too. And I think that's a hundred percent fair. And so yeah. that's why I've, I've kind of created a little bit of a hybrid to pay a predictable return plus some equity on the back end. So that way we can build wealth together. And then it creates yeah. like, like you're saying, John is a lot of um, uh, a long-term partnership between us. Now we see each well, other as long-term business partners. You know, it, it's a lot like my network marketing business. Like why would I, why would I get you in and then treat you like crap? So not only do I lose you, right. Right. But you're also probably not going to say the best things about me if anybody brings my name up in conversation. And then in addition to that, that means I got to go replace you. I got to go find someone else. Right. Now, if you're like a bad person, you're like, a, you know, cancer in my organization. OK, you know, bye, Felicia. Like, yeah. <laughs> but if it's if it's somebody that I'm like, I like this person, I like working with them. I'm not going to have the mindset like I already got them. Let me move on and find other people. No, I'm going to I'm going to nurture that relationship and continue to make sure that they're taken care of. Because I just get it. I would want someone to take care of me if I'm making them money. If I'm, you know, easy to work with, like, wouldn't they want me happy forever? Mm -hmm. And wouldn't I want them happy? It's that that mutual relationship and respect, and and you know, just having uh, uh, the best possible, uh, you know, working relationship so that it can last long term. And it goes back to what you said at the very beginning, right? Providing value, continuing yeah. to provide value after they're already working with you. The more value you give to them, dude, it, it, you don't reap a wind, you reap a whirlwind. You know, it comes mm -hmm. back many, many times and you're able to build long-term great relationships and uh, build a lot of wealth long-term together. So dude, this has been, this has been amazing. So many knowledge bombs dropped. I appreciate all the value you've been bringing here. I want to ask you two questions. To, yep. to close out with one is what is some of the best advice? I don't care if it's relationship advice, if it's financial advice, if it's, um, 
uh, personal development type advice? Like what's, what's, when I ask you a question, like what is the best advice you've ever given or, or gotten? What would that be? What's the first thing that kind of comes to mind? I mean, probably the old Jim Rohn quote, work harder on yourself than you do in your job. Mm. You know, I mean, that wow. personal development piece was everything for me. I mean, that was, and, and it, at the time it wasn't like, okay, Jim, I'm going to work on myself. But looking back, that's it right there. That's everything, yeah. right? Yeah, so, success so, is not something you pursue. Success is something you attract by the person you yeah. become. And that's 100% yeah. accurate. You everything. think it's just like fugazi, fugazi, fairy dust, you know, like, yeah. is it real? Yeah. I don't know. But dude, yeah. I just believed in it because a lot of people who were very, very successful said the same thing. And I was like, let me just do it. And I work harder on myself. And it's amazing, man, like what comes from personal development, reading the right books, hanging in the right social circles, going mm -hmm. to the right events, uh, not, and not only doing the progressive things, but also eliminating the, the, the non-progressive things like, yeah. you know, reality TV nonsense and, you know, all the crap and all like the negative relationships and the, and the negative people in your life and getting all that stuff out and eliminating that and then mm -hmm. adding on the progressive good stuff. Environment's a big deal. Big, yep. That's what that is right there, man. That's environment. Yep. Yep. Like how many of us just like literally you listen to this whole podcast and this would be the best point right here. It's like, who are you hanging out with? Mm -hmm. You know, where, where, where are you spending your time? You can read a good book. You can watch a podcast go, I'm fired up. And then you go hang out with your loser friends tonight and go get drunk. Yep. The environment's everything, man. And, yep. and actually you talked about how like, you know, people kept saying that you could be successful and you heard the quotes and you heard all that stuff. But, but it's not just that, Tim, you know what it was? You saw other people around you winning and doing the do. And it starts to, it starts to, to make it more realistic to you. You start to believe that like, dude, if that dude can do it and she can yeah. do it, I'm literally, I remember you signing up or I remember you and, and you're doing it and you're doing it. Like what the heck? I can do this. Right. Yeah. It, I heard a quote the other day and they said, um, it wasn't really a quote, but it was like kind of, kind of a, a, an analogy, an example. And she goes, you know, a second grader can't relate to a senior in high school. Who does the second grader look up to? Third the graders, fourth graders. Yeah. Yeah. Fourth grader, right? Fifth grader, whatever. Third grader. They, they look up to someone that's just a little bit ahead of them. So yeah. that environment piece is such a big deal surrounding yourself. Like you have a big event coming up, right? At the time of this recording, you got a big, anybody that's remotely serious needs to be at that event. It's mm -hmm. not just the information the organized knowledge they're going to get, but it's, they're going to be hanging out with other people that are doing the do that are just like them that yep. may, maybe they can't relate to you because you're doing so well. Now they'll learn from you, but they can't relate to you. Just like I got network marketers. They're like, they're afraid to even approach me. Mm -hmm. They're afraid to even talk to me. Now I know I'm normal, but to them, it's like, they can't see 18 years. Right. They can't see six figures a month, yep. but they can, they can relate to that person that's doing their first testimonial on stage. Mm -hmm. You don't realize how important your story is how important your environment is because when you're hanging out with other people that are, that are playing big, when you're hanging out with other people that are working on their dream, when they're working on their thing, you're more inspired versus hanging out with the loser friends and hanging out with people, the, the, the negative, the negative uncle that just keeps telling you, you're not going to have success. You're wasting your time. And it sucks because sometimes they're not negative, but they love you and they're trying to protect you. Yep. And you just got to tell them, shush, like, I don't need your advice. I don't need your wisdom. I don't need your protection. I'm good. Yep. Because when you buy their opinion, you buy their freaking lifestyle. And if they're not love where that. you want to be, then. <laughs> I love it, dude. Dude, we, we are on such the same, the same wavelength. Um, cool. Final question. Last question. What does legacy mean to you? This is a legacy wealth show. What does legacy mean to John Melton? Whew, that's a, that's a probably a one, like dude. a really, that's like a really deep, right? Deep question. Um, but to me, legacy is building something that's going to last long after I'm gone, mm -hmm. right? Like to me, that's, that's everything, right? Like my, the, the legacy that I leave with my children, with the people that I'm impacting with, I mean, that dude, honestly, I, I heard Bob Hyland talk about this one time and I never thought about this until he mentioned it, but it's like, there's people that might watch the video you do today, decades from now, like your great grandchildren could watch your video that you're doing right like that gives me chills dude yeah, because cool. how cool would it be how cool would it be tim to watch like 
especially like your, your family members that have passed on, right? Like, you know, your grandparents, like I never met most of my, I only met my granddad. And by the time I like was aware of him, he was like already going senile and he was super old and he was an alcoholic. Like how cool would it be for me to watch his videos Yeah. from like when he was 25 or 32? Yeah. Like that's, that's kind of crazy when you think about the legacy that you're creating every day, which could be scary for some of y'all that, you know, you're put, putting some stuff out there on social media that you probably right. wouldn't be proud to reread yeah. decades from now or have your great great grandchildren read one day so so everything right with the conversations you have with your children the businesses you're building today the relationships you're establishing the people you're pouring into the content you put to the the the, the universe right social media right whatever uh i think all of that is is building a legacy and it's mm -hmm. it's uh it's something that you got to think about right you got to think about every everything you say everything you do uh has has a consequence good or bad so uh, to me, that's what legacy is all about. Love that, man. And that dude, as you say that, I'm, I'm like, that's really, really powerful because then it, it aligns you with the person that you want to become. And it goes back to what we said at the very beginning is comparing yourself to you. Is what I'm saying today going to make me a better person in the future? Is what I'm saying today, you know, like it. it Will you be proud? Will you right. look back and go, damn, glad I said that 25 years ago. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's powerful stuff, man. Awesome. Dude, this has been so amazing. I appreciate all the value you've offered, John. And um, dude, thank you so much, man. Look forward to, I, I appreciate you and I appreciate, I appreciate our business relationship too. I appreciate you being an yeah. awesome partner and a bunch of apartment buildings of mine. And um, man, anything that I can ever do to help you out, would love to. And um, got to get you back on here, man, because that was so much awesome content. So thank you, brother. And until next time, this is the Legacy Wealth Show. Thanks, man.